Hello everyone, my name is Edie Washington and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Gather. Whether live or online, we believe church should be a truly joyful place where everyone enjoys being together. We are a group of caring believers from all across America and even overseas. And we're dedicated to five principles. We are ecstatically inclusive, joyfully embracing everyone we meet. We are theologically progressive. We're following the example and teachings of the Jesus. We are socially committed and having a material impact on the communities we serve. We are scripturally sound and we're committed to freedom that the Bible declares. And we are spiritually adventurous. We recognize each person's quest for faith is unique and honoring the many ways God is present in our lives. So, no matter where you come from, how you identify, and what you believe, You belong here with us. We celebrate all that you are and invite you to enjoy this time of worship with us. Welcome, everyone. be a harvest for the world that question launches every service here at gather because even as we 
come together to enjoy one another's company, to celebrate our God, to celebrate our faith and our community. There is always a question beyond what we're doing here, something bigger than this moment that wants to know, when will there be a harvest for the world? And so it's in that framework of getting all we can out of this time together in order to give it away in other places where it's needed that I welcome you to gather to our online worship service where we meet together once a month here on YouTube just to celebrate our faith and one another. My name is Tim Wolf, and I'm the pastor of this most extraordinary group of people who come literally from all over the world. And so while we're here together, I encourage you to uh, join in the chat if you're signed in and are able of doing that or leave a comment. Make sure you let us know that we're here because it's just a joy to have you with us. And so as we always do, we want to begin this time together with prayer. And I want to invite you just to sit with it for just a moment to just kind of get in touch with the God of your understanding. Who is God for you? I think of the great songwriter Richard Smallwood who says, God, you're the source of my strength. You're the strength of my life. And because I know that, I just lift my hands in total praise to you. And so right now, we're just going to go to the God of our understanding, knowing this God to have been faithful to us in so many ways and begin by saying, Lord, we just thank you. God, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for all the ways that you have been with us, the moments that you provided for us, the moments that you've kept us, the ways that you've encouraged us when there was no help to be found, God, you stepped in and you were our help in very, very present times of danger, God. And you came in and you made a way for us, God. We thank you that you're our provider. We thank you, God, that you're a healer. We thank you, Lord, that you are the just you are just the joy. God, you are just the joy of our salvation. Oh God, and so today we just come to honor and celebrate you. We thank you, God, because above all else, you change us. The more we get to know you, the deeper we get to know ourselves and all the different ways that you help us find new ways of being, encountering new ways of moving in your spirit, charting new paths for our lives and for our own growth, God. I pray that something that happens in this time together will do just that, that it will be transformative for us that it will remind us of who we are and what we are and why we matter to you, God. I thank you for every one of my faith siblings that are here in this time, for those that will come later. God, I thank you for those that may stumble on us, strangers that will become part of this wonderful family that you have called into existence, this great group of people that identify as gather. And so now for the next few minutes, all that happens is for you because it all comes from you, and it is all because of you. And so we give your name the praise. Amen. A change.
Today, the world needs to focus on the teachings of Jesus and the Golden Rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I am a beloved child of God. Refugees are beloved children of God. People experiencing homelessness are beloved children of God. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a beloved child of God. Those I don't agree with are beloved children of God. That's one change we need in the world, is to remember that. One change the world needs right now is to eliminate the fear we have over trying something new. When the way we do something has been the same for years and years and has produced results that don't work, I think we're afraid to say, let's scrap it and start anew. And I think if we were more inclined to do that, to get rid of the thing that's not working and start fresh, um, we could see a lot of good from that. So that's one change I think the world needs right now. The world needs compassion. One change would probably be having gun laws in states that would require you know, training, just like like vehicles would have would require training. So in that case, there would be less mass shootings. The world needs truth. No more lies. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. Yeah, yeah. So you cleaned me up inside. Ooh. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life so I could be free. free. So I could be all of us. So I could tell. Sacrificed your life for me. 
Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him, My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowded in on him was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch the hem of his garments, I will be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house saying to Jairus, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid, just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him, and he threw them all out. Then, taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kaum, which means, Young woman, get up. 
Suddenly, the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. Then he told them to give her something to eat. Pray with me. God, these next few moments find us with our ears wide open to hear what you would have us to hear, to know, God, to consider, to think, to contemplate, to do. So I pray that your spirit will speak to us in very real and very direct ways. Let the words that come from my mouth, let the meditation that flows in each heart be counted worthy of you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We thank you now for your word, God. Send it with power and we will be grateful. Amen. This passage from Mark is one of our best examples of what preachers call a pericope, which is just a fancy word that we use to identify a unit of scripture that is meant to be read in public as all of one piece. That's not to say that the two interwoven stories, one about a dying young girl and the other about a woman whose life is slowly bleeding out, can't stand alone. They're both beautiful and they're bracing by themselves and I've heard them preached singly to great effect. But an engrossing conversation springs up when the woman's tale stays nested inside the little girl's story. That's when we discover what we need to understand in our own time and place, and that is what a pericope is supposed to do. This one is unique in its focus because it's about female bodies. In the framing story, we have a preteen comatose girl. The urgency of her condition becomes apparent when Mark tells us her father is waiting for Jesus when he returns from sailing across Lake Galilee. The girl's condition is underscored by two details that we cannot overlook. Her father is a synagogue bigwig who is imploring a traveling gadabout healer to help his daughter, and he asks for help in a very specific way. Place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. Much like today, in Jesus' world, religious bigwigs don't confer, let alone plead, with non-ordained, unorthodox clergy. So this man's actions confess a few things publicly that he'd be loath to admit privately. His churchy privilege provides no cover or advantage in terms of helping his daughter. Her illness is too daunting, her symptoms too perplexing for conventional treatment. This is his little girl, and something inside him needs her to live, which is also rather unusual. First century fathers don't have much use for little girls until they're old enough to get married, meaning old enough to get pregnant, because in this society, a woman's sole task is bringing sons into the world. And yet here he is, praying Jesus will help his little girl live. And so this man, Jairus, is fully exposed in the inadequacy of his faith practices and the insanity of his social norms. And just to put the final touch on this most peculiar situation, he begs Jesus to lay his hands on the child, breaking from every imaginable taboo that stigmatizes any female who's been touched by a male other than her husband. You see, the problem that Jairus has is he doesn't have good religion. It's bogged down in status and title and gender roles that raise inhibitions rather than embrace a faith that sees every human being as God made. And all of this plays out in the small, unconscious body of a daughter who's lived as long as the older woman has suffered when she comes into the story looking for Jesus. For 12 years, this poor soul has been held captive in her own house due to a nonstop menstrual flow. 
Mosaic laws forbid her to go out in public, lest she contaminate her surroundings with blood. For 12 years, she has been apart from her community, unable to attend temple, unable to participate in Passover and Pentecost feasts, unwelcome in her local marketplace and the synagogue, practically invisible to everyone but those who are brave enough to come see about her. And to do that, costs a steep price because anyone who comes into her home and touches her or her belongings is likewise deemed unclean and has to go through a very painstaking, time-consuming, purifying ritual. The physical struggle that is happening in this lady's body is amplified by her alienation and the religiously justified intentional neglect of so-called God-fearing people. In the early years of the HIV AIDS crisis, I witnessed something that put me in mind of this hemorrhaging woman. I was living in LA and as more and more men and not much later women plummeted into the down spiral of AIDS related diseases, it fell upon the queer community at large to care for many of them. Their families and faith communities turned against them based on the premise that AIDS was God's revenge for their sinfulness. With not a pang of conscience, these super-saved, self-professing, Holy Ghost-filled Christians didn't flinch at letting their own flesh and blood, their sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, die alone. We went into the homes of perfect strangers to sit with them and care for them, to read to them, to talk with them, masked and gowned. We held them when they shook with chills and fever. We carried them in our arms to get them to the restroom. We changed their spoiled linens. We held cups to their dry lips so they could get a sip of cool water in thrush-lined mouths. And for me, the worst of it all was how often these precious souls gave in to this ideology of a hater God who not only punished their bodies now in this present life, but according to the religion of their no-show families, planned on letting their souls burn in hell forever. Bad religion is dangerous because it traps people and it destroys hope and it alienates folks in their suffering and then it withholds all hope that things will get better. If the pain weren't enough, the bleeding woman has bankrupted her life savings on doctors who can't help her and instead, after she has spent all her money, she's only got worse. Ched Meyer, who probably knows Mark's gospel better than any human li uh, living right now, writes this. He says, this woman is doubly poor, doubly outcast. As a result of her physical condition, she should be perpetually segregated. And the squandering of money upon inefficacious medical care was a perennial problem for the poor in antiquity. But then Meyer can't help himself and puts into his scholarly work a truth that dominates the Gospels. He writes, in contrast, the true physician will cure this woman without charge. In my own imagination, I see her alone in her room, barely able to stay alive. Her money's gone. Her friends and family are gone. She's a social pariah. Her clothes are stained and unpresentable. Her body is frail. Her face is lined with worry. And along the way, she realizes that her religion, this thing that has boxed her into her house, has failed her. For all of its obsessions with purity and cleanliness, it is corrupt and filthy to the core. One afternoon, she hears a lot of ruckus in the street, and she pulls back the tattered drape that keeps her out of sight from her neighbors, and she sees Jesus walking in a swarm of people. When she, when she catches sight of Jairus, she rightly assumes they must be headed to his house because she's heard talk that his little girl is dying. 
Why this synagogue prelate would turn to a country rabbi for help confuses her. But maybe, maybe Jairus knows something she doesn't know, or, or maybe he's been thinking what she's been thinking. This religion of ours is fine and dandy if you're able-bodied and you have a full bank account. But when sickness comes to your house, when it's your little girl who's dying, when you're a woman whose health means so little she can stay shut away and forgot about, when you're a gay man dying in delirium with no family or clergy in sight, when you're a brown-skinned day laborer who's left to die of COVID in a hospital corridor because you've got no health care and can't afford any better, when you're a 10-year-old rape victim whose right to terminate a diabolical pregnancy puts you at the center of a controversy that triples the trauma you've already sustained in your body, when you are in these conditions, religion is not always your friend. In fact, quite often and regularly, as we see in this text, as we see nearly every time we read the news, religion can be your worst nightmare. It could be an enemy that not only bewilders your logic and bothers your conscience, bad religion is harmful to bodies. So the woman says, to hell with all this religious nonsense. I need healing. If I can just touch Jesus' clothes, I know I'll be whole. He doesn't need to come to my house. He doesn't need to know my name. He doesn't even need to see me. I can't be worried about contaminating everything I touch because I need to be touched myself. My pain needs to be felt. My weakness needs company. Surely somebody understands how terrible this feeling of powerless, powerlessness must be. And so she touches Jesus, just his clothes, and he stops. And he says, who touched me? It's a dumb question. It's the, the disciples are baffled by it. Who touched you? Jesus is being mobbed and jostled and pushed and pulled in every direction. Who touched you? But that's not what he's asking. Who touched me, he says because something inside me has changed. I'm sensing deep isolation and pain and profound weakness. I'm sensing powerlessness because power has left me. The woman confesses and Jesus' reply anticipates the answer to Jairus' concern about his 12-year-old daughter, because he says to this woman, daughter, your faith, has healed you. Not your religion, not your understanding, not your reasoning, your faith. I'm sure when Jairus sees this unfold, his own faith kicks in because when Jesus gets to his house, everyone is hysterical with grief. It seems that the little girl has passed and Jesus tells them, no, 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 she's not dead. And they laugh at him. What do you know? You're a country rabbi. You're some guy. You're this walkabout healer. But he winds up getting the last laugh when he calls her out of her coma and she immediately gets up and he says, you know, she's weak in her body. Give her something to eat. Two women, weak in their bodies, brought to life, restored by Jesus. These two brilliantly intertwined stories come to us as miracle tales, and it's awfully easy to let them be that and no more. Jesus the healer, Jesus the resurrection, Jesus the life goes from place to place, healing people and bringing folks back from death's door. But if we leave it at that, at just a miracle story, we miss the driving force behind these narratives, their raison d'etre, the reason why they got told again and again among the very first believers. They, the reason why they got told so often they made it into the collective unconscious and got written down in the book while other anecdotes got forgot and left out. What we see in these stories is good religion at work, 
pure religion practiced by radicals, not only by Jesus, but the kind of radical believers who can cut through the muck and the mire of bad religion to find a new way of being and believing and behaving, to allow the change that God makes possible to overtake them in such a way that all things, including the way they feel about religion, gets made new. This is what makes radical religion radical. The insistence that we don't have to accept what we've been taught as unquestionably sacred. And often the way we learn that is through stories and other forms of artistic expression, protest music and visual arts and plays and movies that sound like and move like the pericope in Mark. The great American revolutionary Angela Davis once said, art reminds us we are not obligated to recognize what is given simply because it's given. Rather, it helps us cultivate the imagination to make something new of the old. That's really all radical faith is. It's a cultivated imagination that makes something new out of the old. It's radical faith that compels Jairus to set aside his religious status and privilege so he can publicly, boldly put his trust in a healer who just got off the boat. It's radical faith that pushes the hemorrhaging woman out of her door and into a crowd, ignoring every religious and social restriction placed on her. It's radical, radical faith that drives us to keep going despite all the bad religious weight we carry, to learn that we can toss all of that aside and say, there's good religion out there and I want it. I'm not ashamed to ask for it and I'm not ashamed to own it once I get it. In his letter to the worldwide church, the apostle James, who is thought to be Jesus's brother, tells us what good religion is. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress or a dying 12-year-old girl, or a woman who's not been able to stop her menses for, as, for just as long, for just as 12 years, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The wonderful Latinx James um, scholar Elsa Thomas calls this kind of religion militant, indomitable patience that awaits opportune moments. I'm going to say that again. Pure religion is militant, indomitable patience that awaits opportune moments. That's what we see in today's text. And that's pure religion for radicals, seizing every opportunity to care for people no matter who they are, no matter where they are, what labels they wear, how stained their clothes may be, how horrible and triggering their religious experience has been until now. Walking away from religion, that's a patsy strategy. That's so easy, it changes nothing. It doesn't fix any of the problems that allegedly push you away. But when we embrace the idea that good religion is radical, not only do we change religion, we experience a transformation that can't be explained any more than we can explain how the woman's bleeding instantly stopped or why the girl immediately came to life. They were miracles. Good religion is a miracle. Are you ready for a miracle? I know I am. Amen. A couple weeks ago, it was my joy to be in Phoenix, Arizona for the Leadership Conference of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, which Gather belongs to, and which I'm ordained in and serve as a bishop-elect for the Midwest region. 
And one of the great joys of that gathering, and I have to tell you, it was the whole thing was just off the chain. But one of the great joys of that gathering was hearing my colleagues preach. And one of them, Bishop-elect Durrell Goodwin from New England, preached a sermon. Well, everybody's sermon was un, un, just unforgettable. But his sticks with me in a very particular kind of way. And he sort of talked about, you deserve a plate. And what he meant by that was that so many of us have been conditioned by faith and to a certain extent do-goodism to just deprive ourselves, to, to put ourselves at the end of the line. And after everybody else has been fed, we'll take whatever scraps are left over. Even though we may have worked two and three and four days putting the feast together, we never get a taste of it because we have decided that that's the thing to do. And he said, no, 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 no. That's not, that's contrary to actually what, what scripture teaches. You deserve a plate. And that put me in mind of Jesus's last night with his disciples, where that's effectively what he told them. Don't deprive yourself. You deserve a plate. And he sort of dictated the menu. This is what you should have every time you're together. This is what you should do. This is what the feast should look like. And he kept it simple to keep it miraculous. If it had been terribly complicated and required a whole lot of, a lot of work, it would have become a religious thing that would have required specialists who have to know exactly when to do this and do that and when to swing that and ring that and do all those sorts of things. That's not there for Jesus. He just says, when you're together, you know what, and you, you've got a little bread, you've got a little wine, you've got a little something to drink. Take a minute. Just stop and remember me. And so it's that with that in mind that we come to this table and we say, God, forgive us for all the different ways that we've allowed bad religion and its complications and its all of its protocols and all the all the ways that it tries to put things in boxes and box stuff up and ship it away and check boxes, its obsession with boxes. God forgive us for how much power we've allowed that to have in our lives. All down through history, you have been trying to speak to us in ways that take us out of our boxes, that take us out of our religion, that purify us to be what you would have us to be and repeatedly we have gone back in and said, well, let's get this formalized. Let's make this work a certain kind of way. And this is what this means, and it can't mean anything else. And so you came along, and, and you, you put on a human suit, and you came down, and you began to teach us, and you began to show us in your own words and in your own ministry what good religion looks like. It is the good religion that looks at people wounded by bad religion and provides healing and new life for them. It is good religion that gathers together a motley crew of provincial people, none of them with any real experience, and draws them into a room and sits them down and says, this is my body broken for you. This is a promise in my blood every time that you're together. Do this in remembrance of me. And so now, right now, Holy Spirit, we take the bread that we have at handy. We take the cup of whatever drink we have, may have nearby, and we lift them up to you and say, purify us, O God. O God, take all of the wounds and the impulses, all of the taboos of bad religion, just wash those away. And purify us, O oh God, to do exactly what your word says to do, to care for those without families, to care for those without provision, to keep ourselves unstained in the corruption and the greed and the poison that flows so freely in our world. We give your name the praise for this opportunity to be together, and we ask that you will bless us now as we take this bread and drink from this cup, and we pray all of this in the name of a God who is above all gods, though known by many names, we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So wherever you are, find a cracker, a cookie, a piece of bread. Just take a moment 
to practice good religion, pure religion, simple religion, unstained religion, by remembering who has given us life, who has healed us, who has taken the time to understand our suffering and then to show us that there is a better way. Amen. God, we just say thank you. There's no better word, no more elegance. We could write long-winded prayers with lots of adjectives. We could create very ornate ceremonies with trumpets and horns and banners and robes. We could produce stunning video that wins all kinds of awards, but none of that would impress you. Just this simple thank you, God. Thank you for the change that you have brought about in our lives, for the way that you have saved us from so much, from ourselves, but God, also from just foul notions of what you want and foul ideas of what you command and foul ideas of how we can make ourselves worthy of you because there is no way to do that. God, you have counted us worthy and you have given us these gifts to remember you by. So God, we remember you and we thank you. We bless you now, oh God, we bless your name. We bless your name for your goodness. And we say yes to you, amen. Hello everybody. Um, as we get ready to close our time together, I just want to call your attention to a few brief announcements. Um, next month's gather will be very special. Um, we're going back to a place where we've been before, where we really had a lovely time. We're going back to the beauty bar uh, for a special service with a very special guest speaker, our very own Reverend Michelle Hughes. Woo! Um, she'll be preaching and we're already expecting great things. Um, will happen. That's Sunday, August 14th at 5 p.m. And the location again is the Beauty Bar and that's located at 810 East 43rd Street. Um, please mark your calendars now for it will be a great time. It's going to be right there near 43rd and Cottage Grove around in the Bronzeville area. Um, also, uh, we just wrapped up our latest study series, uh, People of the Book and we will be taking August off. So keep that in mind. We'll be taking August off um, as far as our study series that we do on a weekly basis. So enjoy your summer evenings and plan to come back and uh, we'll be getting it back going in September. And when we do come back in September, we'll start a new conversation called Caesars, Things, and God's Demands. A look at how faith and capitalism conflicts with and often contradicts Christian teaching. Can you believe that? Uh, stay tuned for more details about that. And also, um, we're going to be praying for Pastor Tim and Walt as they're going to be heading off to take some time off to refresh and renew. Um, they totally deserve it, um, as we all do. And we're hoping that they come back recharged and ready in September. Um, if you need any uh, special pastoral care, um, please reach out to me and you can do that um, by my phone number 773-678-8057 or you can reach me by email at rachel, that's R-A-C-H-A-E-L dot gather A-O-P at gmail.com and um, I'll see what I can to just uh, help uh, connect you with um, any resources or um, pastoral care. Um, there's so many pastors or Dane pastors um, that are within our uh, gather community and network that um, I'll do whatever I can to make sure that uh, we address and meet um, whatever needs you may have while Pastor Tim is away. I promise you that. Um, so finally, as we move forward also into this time of giving, a time of reflection, um, a time to practice our faith through um, 
giving back something of all that God has given and blessed us with. And so I personally believe it's an act of my faith to give, um, to give monetarily, to give of my time, um, just to show my appreciation. And also because I know how much it meant for me, for someone to spend some time with me, to someone to help support me in certain ways. And so when we give back into the kingdom of God, we pray that um, the blessings that we are giving a piece of back will also help those in the community as we move forward in the ministry of gather, sharing with people, sharing the love, um, making uh, these experiences of spreading the gospel more accessible for those um, in the Chicagoland area, as well as the country and across the world. So thank you for those who continue to give. I pray that uh, you've already been receiving blessings and, and um, feel and see the impact that it's making. And I encourage you to continue to do so. And you can do that um, through Zelle. You can uh, find us at our email at gatheraop at gmail.com. You can also uh, PayPal. So you can do that at paypal.me forward slash gatheraop. And then also, if you want to send a check, you can email me and I can uh, you know, send you the info and stuff on how to get that to our mailbox. And then also, if you'd like to give cash, cash is king or queen. I like to use the term queen personally. Um, we do that um, at our live services, so you can have the opportunity to do that when we meet on August 14th. So thank you, everybody. I pray that uh, you've been um, uh, rejuvenated, you've gotten what you needed, and that you uh, are blessed to continue on in your weeks and days in Jesus' name. So God bless you, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. I'm so grateful for the life of this community at Gather and all the ways that we're growing and new people are coming in and new eyes, ideas are starting to emerge. And in the fall, we're going to begin to see a lot, a lot of new things added to sort of our, our cop, you know, the way that we do, do work here together, different opportunities for different small groups online and a bunch of other things. A lot of plans are underway. So I want you to stay tuned. I also want to encourage you to be very faithful next month. We're taking the month off in Bible study, but we're not taking the month off. I'm taking the month off. I just want you to know that Walt and I are going to just take some time. Since we started Gather, we've only had one two-week vacation in the entire four years. So we're going to take the month off and leave you in so many capable hands. Do not... Do not do what so many other churches do and say, oh, well, you know, the pastor's gone. I don't have to show up. The truth of the matter is, and any pastor will tell you this, when the pastor's gone is when you especially need to show up. So I'm counting on you all being here and being in full flower and rejoicing. And when I get back, I'm going to look and see what all you did because it'll all be on video anyway. I want to thank you and I want to pray that something that was said here in this time together, I pray that something, something provoked you to think about a transformation that can take place in your life, a way of moving you from some of the shadows of bad religion into the light and the joy and the goodness and the fullness of pure religion. It's a radical move. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the unimaginative. It's not for somebody who isn't ready to swing out and take a few risks. But if you do it, I'm going to tell you what, your life will change. I promise you. So now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ, our brother, our teacher, and our friend, rest, rule, and abide with us all now and forever. Amen.
Jesus is 